We're going to go in chapter 2. Chapter 2. Let's just jump right in uh, tonight. And so great to see all of you here uh, tonight. I don't think it's fair. We have so many wonderful ministers here. And um, I don't know why I have to come and preach three and they preach none. Um, but it's, it's great to be here. Um, I wanted to say, and I, I didn't mention, I don't know if Brother Rapp is here tonight, Rapp Crook, but we had Rapp and Sister Lisbeth down our way and ministered to our young people. They're still talking about it. They just certainly had a wonderful time at Brother Rapp, and uh, it was a real blessing for sure. And uh, I just uh, wanted to say that I appreciate the, the place, uh, you know, the, the church and the, uh, the, the capacity you have and the space you have. I think it's wonderful. It's a wonderful uh, blessing to be able to have a, a nice place you can spread out. I, uh, poking some fun at the square footage this morning, but I uh, just wanted to say uh, for the record that uh, it's just a, uh, just a wonderful place, and uh, we're happy for you and the, the local assembly, and uh, it's just a, a real honor to be here. Joshua chapter 2, and um, we'll read beginning at verse 10. This is a familiar little passage here. And this is about uh, Rahab as she responds to the instructions that the uh, spies give her. And they're telling her that um, there is an invading army coming. She knows about the strength of their God. And she simply says to them, uh, how will I not be destroyed with this whole city when it goes down. They said, no problem. Just hang this cord out the window. It'll be a token. When we see the token, we will uh, not destroy this place. And so she says, thank you. She says, now therefore I pray you, swear unto me by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness, that you will also show kindness unto my father's house. And give me a true token. Give me the real thing. Because this is life or death. Right? If it isn't, if it isn't right, I'm going to die. So I'm going to make sure I got the right thing. So she, she's passionate when she says this. I want to have the right thing. How many of you would like to have the right thing? Lord Jesus, bless our time together. It's in your hands. I pray that you administer, Lord, to each and every heart. And Lord, you know what we have need of. And the ability of the Holy Spirit includes the way that you can take the word and you can apply it to everyone here and we can all get something even a little different from it. But we all walk away satisfied. Only you can do that. We pray now that you would just take complete control of every spirit, including my own, that your Holy Spirit may have preeminence among us. We give you the evening. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. God bless you. This is exactly what, what Rahab said to these spies. She wanted to know exactly what the right requirement would be and what the right thing would, would be for her to have. I think it is a really critical thing for us. And I mean, this is the way I feel about it. I've labored a lot of years in, in serving the Lord and not begrudging any of it. Uh, I've loved doing what I've had to do over these years and uh, serving the Lord, ministering, ministering to these people around the world and uh, still wake up every day and look for new opportunities to do that. And I think it's wonderful. I think it's a great thing. But you know, at the end of the road, I want to make sure my ladder is leaning against the right wall. I don't want to miss it. I, 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 want to be, I want to be believing the right thing. I want to be doing the right thing. I want to be in the right place. I want to be on time. I, I want to make sure I'm dressed right. I want to make sure that everything is correct. I want to have the real thing. I just don't want to have something. I want to have the real thing. Because we're going to leave all of this behind, and we're, we're, uh, you know, we're going to a place. And it's life or death, right? You either go and live forever, or you stay and go through the tribulation with everybody else that's left here on the earth. 
So it's come down to this kind of a choice that Rahab also had to make. And, and you know, the question she asked, you, you're, you're telling me that I need to just display this token? Uh, yes. And she said, make sure then you give me a real token. I want to have the real thing. Now, we talk a lot in, in meetings, and uh, I was just recently at a youth meeting, and, and we had a minister there, and he was just very uh, gifted in his evangelistic way. Very gifted. You all know who it is if I told you his name. Uh, and he was uh, just, you know, very passionate about uh, talking about the Holy Ghost and uh, encouraging the young people to come and receive the Holy Spirit. And I I just felt in my heart before I went to that meeting because the pastor asked me to come and minister as well. And he, he was interested in helping the young people to know what it means actually to have the Holy Ghost. Like what, what does the Holy Ghost do in me? After the meeting's over and I go home, what happens then? What's step number one, step number two, step number three? And if we get the real thing in the meeting, what does the real thing accomplish in me? And he was, he was talking that way to me. And so I began to think about this whole idea of the real thing. And uh, I, I, I phrased this, or, uh, you know, I, I framed this, this meeting in a couple of questions here. Is uh, the Holy Ghost different than the token? And what is the evidence of the real thing? If I, if I uh, have the real thing, how is it going to show up? How am I going to know? And then when is a person saved? They asked Brother Branham that question, when is a person saved? And he gave a fantastic answer uh, to the question. And he went down through the steps of salvation. And uh, it, it's really good. Whenever uh, we have a baptism in our church, I always print out the answer to that question he gave and give it to somebody because it really explains well uh, what it means to be saved. And then what outward signs will a person show? Now there's lots more we could talk about in relation to this subject. And we have... Uh, lots of fine ministers here, I'm sure, could add their part. But I, I wanted to just share some things that uh, I trust will be a blessing to you tonight. Now, uh, Brother Branham makes this statement in 1915. He says, on the day of Pentecost, Peter said, it's for you and your children and to them that's afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Every person that enters into the baptism of the Holy Spirit can have the same kind of Holy Spirit that they got on the day of Pentecost. Oh, hang on. Let me say it again, you probably didn't hear me. Every person that enters into the baptism of the Spirit can have the same kind of Holy Ghost that they got on the day of Pentecost. That's better. This is not another spirit. This is not another different kind of salvation. This is not another version of it here. This is not some modernized version. This is the same Holy Ghost that fell on the day of Pentecost. That's the same Holy Ghost that exists here tonight. The same Holy Ghost that they got, you got. The same Holy Ghost that they experienced, that's the same Holy Ghost that we have tonight. So this is, this is a continuum. This is the same thing that, uh, that's why, you know, Paul, Brother Branham said that, uh, you know, hey, if Paul made it in, I'm going to make it in. Because the same thing he preached, that's what I preach over here. It's the same Holy Ghost inspiring those two men of God. And he said, I believe that. Not something that looked like it, but the real thing. So I don't want to have something that looks like the real thing and acts like the real thing. I want to have the real thing. I don't want to have to feel like I got to be like this guy and I got to, I got to uh, you know, react like this sister over here. I, I want to have the real thing where God deals with me. And the Holy Ghost brings forth the same kind of an evidence and proof they had back there. Comes with the same Holy Ghost. Because it's not a different Holy Ghost. It's the same thing. And that's a really important thing for us to hang on to as we go through this tonight. Now he says, in the great full gospel church, let me give you a little theory here first of all, and the great full holy, why don't we read it right? Why don't we just go ahead and say we're going to read these quotes right tonight? And the great full gospel church has become nearly a floor show. This is 1957. This is 64 years ago. I know that because I was born in 1957. Wow? Who said wow? Deacons? Did you say wow? <laughs> the younger generation has no respect at all. That's true, 1957. You know what happened in 1957? America sinned away its day of grace in 1957. But I'll tell you something else. I wasn't living in America in 1957. 
Now, the great full gospel church has become nearly a floor show. In 1957, we're looking at the advent of television and television evangelism. We're looking at, uh, you know, Oral Roberts taking the message now instead of in a tent, but taking it in a broadcast and reaching not hundreds and thousands, but millions of people who had TVs. This is now big business. This is now big money. This is changing the face and the tone of evangelism in America. This is really big business. And so Brother Branham's looking at that in 1957, and he says you have so much Hollywood evangelism. Now it's all about production. Now it's all about performance. We've lost a little of this thing called worship, and now it's become choreographed to the place where it's got to be just right and sound just right, and they come in on cue and go out on cue, and we're lacking what we, it, it used to be guided by, governed by inspiration, and now it's governed by ratings. And here's Brother Branham saying that you've got Hollywood, you've got a, you've got a, a, a if you like, a baptism of Hollywood over this evangelistic move that happens in such an important time. Hey, listen, they have a prophet on the scene at this time that Hollywood is pulling this entire evangelistic movement in the country away from what it should be into something else. And here's a prophet standing here. This should not be going away from that. It should be coming towards that, right? It should be coming closer to God, and it's not. And he's watching it. God help us to tear that thing from the pulpit and get back to the Word of God and the true baptism of the Holy Spirit. He says we need that. Here's a prophet looking at the age and looking at the direction and the momentum there. Or, if you like, in your terms, he's looking at the trend. This is trending away from inspiration. This is trending away from the simplicity of the Holy Spirit. And this is trending towards ratings and uh, who's got the best program, who's got the biggest following. And he's looking at that and condemning that. That's 1957. And I, I, remember, I remember those years. I remember the years that followed after that. And, uh, you know, we were Catholics when we grew up, but my mother used to like to watch Oral Roberts and the program and the music and everything else. And, uh, you know, it was, it was really quite an extraordinary thing when I read back in later years, heard Brother Branham talking about that. And so you, you want to, in other words, Brother Branham's saying you want to let God do this. You don't want to let Hollywood take over here. You want to let God do this. There's some things you better leave in the hands of God and not, not let somebody else fashion this, but... Let, let God do it. Let God inspire it. Let God grow it. Let God grow it. Let God fashion this thing. And then we find in Exodus chapter 20 here a similar scripture which may, may seem a little bit unusual, but God said, If thou wilt make an alt, me an altar of stone, thou shalt not build it of hewn stone. For if thou lift up thy tool upon it, thou hast polluted it. When, when I build an altar, I want to take the stones myself and these are rough stones, and I want to fashion them myself. I don't want to take somebody else's work and refashion that. I want to take this stone, and I want to work on it myself. And that's what God said. Don't take up stones that are already hewn. They've already got a, they've already got a shape to them. They've already got a way about them. Don't take those up, but just go get the rough stones and bring them and put them and make my altar out of that. And you know what? I, I believe with all my heart that, that in this age, I believe that God is after the same thing. He doesn't want you to take your ideas and your ideas and your ideas and bring them into the house of God. He wants to take you in your roughness and in your, uh, in, in your innocence, and he wants to take that and begin to fashion you himself. He wants to mold you himself. He wants to shape you in a certain way, and he doesn't want you to come and say, well, I've already been shaped. I've already done that. I already know that. I already... He doesn't want that at all. He wants to take the rough material, the raw material, and begin to work with that, and that's what he wants to do with the bride of Christ. He wants to fashion us his way. He doesn't want to have Hollywood work on you. He doesn't want to have the world work on you. He wants to work on you himself. That's the work of the Holy Spirit to do that internally. Let me just graphically portray this real quickly. This is, this is the condition we were all in. We're all born in sin, shaped in iniquity, come to the world speaking lies. Our sin separated us from God. But we need, we need to respond to that, and people respond to it in different ways. Some people feel like if I do enough good deeds... I'll make it. Or if I live a moral life, I'll do it. If I go to church, I'll do it. If I give enough money, then I'll make it across. But people in their dealings with this, they find they fall short, right? Because there are not enough good deeds to get you across the chasm. 
they're not, uh, they're not enough uh, strict standards for you to live by that you can get across the chasm. None of us could make it across. But you know, there's still people trying to get across that chasm outside of Christ. But the good news is that Jesus Christ stepped into that, into that gap, into that breach, and made a way for us. He became the Goel, and we are to put our faith in him and our trust in him so that uh, we, can, we can say, it's not just me now, but it's you and Christ as persons together. It's the Holy Spirit, his life, same one that fell on the day of Pentecost, working his own life through you. That's really what this is, isn't it? It's you and Christ as persons together, the Holy Spirit, his life, his actual life in you working together to make you what, you what you're predestinated to be. And it's for everybody. It's not another Holy Spirit. It's the same Holy Spirit that transformed Paul. That's the same Spirit that transformed Brother Branham. That's the same Spirit that's at work in you. Making you what he's predestinated you to be. Right? Everybody together? That's salvation. This is salvation 101. And then God created us to enjoy a personal relationship with him and have a purpose in life. That's what God wanted. That's what we all want, is to have a purpose in life. We want to have a reason to live. We want to have, we want to live in the perfect will of God. But it'll never mean anything to you until you are a witness of the resurrection of Jesus Christ by the infilling of the power of the Holy Spirit. It'll never mean, it'll really be just someone else's word. And if you're convinced of it, let me tell you, there'll come a time when somebody who's smarter than you will convince you of something else. You need to have more than just, a, a, you know, an, an understanding here. Like they sang tonight, you got to let it drop from your head to your heart. It's got to be something that's real that you cannot, you can't, nobody can separate it from you. Been there, done that, you know, try something else because this is real to me. It's, it's not something that I, I, I just, I learned by sitting in the pew and associating with message people uh, just in the same way that if you go out and live in the forest doesn't mean you're a tree. If you come to a message church, doesn't mean you're a believer. You, you, you're born a believer, right? It, no, no one has ever been able to join the coffee family. The, everyone who's a part of it has been born into it, and uh, we've tried to find ways out. But nobody can come into it unless you're born a coffee because that's the way families operate. And it'll really never mean anything to you, permanent or eternal, until you're a witness of the resurrection yourself and you experience this new birth. All right, so that's, that's you, you know all of that I said so far. All of that, that's why I said it fast. So let me throw something at you here. I love this little story and uh, the, the, the scriptures that follow here. Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, how long does thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. And Jesus answered and said, I told you and you believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. The reason we are where we are in terms of a part of the body of Christ is not because of what you've done, but because of who he predestinated. We are held by election. We're not held by conduct. You didn't make it into this by conduct. You're held by election. You're brought here by election. Come on, you're brought here by what God decided before the foundation of the world. You just woke up to the fact that you're not going to go to hell with the rest of the world. You, you realize you're a son and daughter of God more than just a son and a daughter of your parents. And, and it's election that we thank God for. It's election and, and the grace of God that has found us. And, and not only that, but this election in verse 28, it assures you that nobody is going to pluck you out of, out of his hand. There's not enough power. There's not enough forces in the world to pluck you out of his hand. And so if he predestinated you and he holds you, there's nobody can unhold you. You believe that? Jesus says it again. While I was with them in the world, I keep them in, my, in, in thy name. Those thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost, save the son of perdition. None of them is lost. Nobody can pluck them out of my hand. Absolutely not. So therefore, what Rahab wanted was a token. She wanted the thing that served as a a, a real representation of the real thing. And they gave her the distinguishing banner uh, that she did, and you all know this. This is the story of the, of the red cloth that she hung from her window. So Brother Random asked the question, what is the baptism with the Holy Ghost? He said, it is the Spirit baptizing you into the body of Christ. It is the new birth. 
It is the Spirit of God coming in and filling you after you have repented and been baptized in water as an answer of, of a good conscience towards God. What is the baptism of the Holy Ghost? It is the Spirit baptizing you into Christ. It is the new birth. It's the Spirit of God, same Spirit of God they had on the day of Pentecost coming in and filling you, and so now you're persons together with Him. I think it's a wonderful thing. Now, I gotta, if you don't mind, I'm just going to do this here so I can see on my side. <clears throat> this is a really important scripture, and I need you to just all stay with me for another minute here in the theory part. In Acts chapter 13, it's a really, really important event. And this is where Paul is at Antioch, and he's preaching there. And as his custom was, he would go into a town like Antioch, and there were no Christian churches. There were no believers' churches in, in Antioch back in Paul's day. So he would go to where people would go in the town when they visited, and that is in the synagogue. He goes in the synagogue, and he begins, he begins to talk. He's got credentials. So he's go, he goes in, and he begins to talk on the Sabbath day, and the whole city, the Bible says the whole city together, they came together to hear the word of God. Paul's got a reputation. He's got a uh, story behind him. And so people come to listen. They want to hear about this controversial person. And when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy, and they spake against the things that were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. They were, they were trying to undermine, they were trying to undo the things that Paul was building here. And Paul and Barnabas waxed bold. And they said uh, to the Gentiles and all the people that were there, they said, it is right that the gospel should have been first spoken to you. And he says, but now you judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life. And as a result of that, he said, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. We're actually going to take this gospel, we're going to take the word of God and all it contains, and we're going to take it from the Jewish people and give it to the Gentiles. Now you gotta imagine there was a lot of Jewish people who were listening to Paul and just, I mean, uh, you wanna run that by us again? We are the children of the prophets. I can take you to the temple and show you who my father was and my grandfather and my great-grandfather all the way back. I can go all the way back to David. I can let you know that we are the children who have the covenants and the promises. We are the people who still carry around the Ten Commandments on stone. And now you're telling us that you're going to take this from us which God bestowed upon us and you're going to give it to somebody else? Who in the world do you think you are? You got to imagine how they must have reacted to Paul for so as the Lord commanded us he said I have set thee to be a light to the Gentiles that thou shouldst be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. He falls back on what God has told him in the beginning there and when the Gentiles heard this they were glad naturally if you were a Gentile, wouldn't you be glad? You mean everything that the Jews were promised by Jehovah, now it's, now it's ours? And, and, and they're catching on to this. And they were glad and they glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. Because people who are ordained to eternal life, they do believe. Right? They don't, they don't build websites against the message. They believe. People who are ordained to eternal life, they believe. They love to believe. It's, uh, they know what's right. They've got it figured out, you know, because they never figured it out. God revealed it to them, and that's how they know what's right. And so people who are ordained to eternal life, they don't, they don't wrestle with this. They just, they just they believed. And here's Paul standing there, you know, with all these Jews, and, and the Jews are, must have been going like this, you know, with this, with this face. <laughs> really? Really? You think you're going to come in? to our temple here and take all of this from us and give it to the Gentiles. Really? And Paul just looked at them and said, really? <laughs> now what this, what this means is something really important. What this means is something really significant because it changed everything. It changed everything. Because now the promises that God made to Jews that were unfulfilled, now all of a sudden came to the Gentiles. There were promises in the Old Testament that had remained unfulfilled until now, and 
now all of a sudden they were not the possession or the inheritance of the Jews. They were now given to the Gentiles. Here's one of them. This never happened in the Old Testament. This was to come with the coming of the Holy Spirit. Right? This never happened in the Old Testament. This is what Ezekiel prophesied. And it never happened in the Old Testament. But because the Holy Spirit could come and now perform this, I will sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean from all your filthiness. And a new heart will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I'll put my spirit within you. Show me where that happened in the Old Testament. It didn't because it required the coming of the Holy Spirit to actually come in behind the veil and now be persons together with you. You know what? When Ezekiel said this, this was for the Jews. This was a promise for the Jews to receive the Holy Spirit, but they never received it. And now at the point where the Holy Spirit is now available to come to the Jews, Paul takes the promise and gives it to another. Let me tell you, saints of God, you received this tonight because Paul came and took that from the Jews and gave it to the Gentiles. One day, it'll go back to the Jews again. One day, it will return to them when they are restored. But Paul took that and gave it to the Gentiles. And now, you have a new heart within you, and you have a new spirit within you, and you have, you have his life in you because what was supposed to be given to the Gentiles, they were due to, the, to the Jews, they rejected, and now God gave it to you. So that's why this experience can be yours tonight because in the sovereignty of God, he gave it. To the Gentiles. Wow. This changed everything. And I'll put my spirit in here and I'll cause you to walk in my statutes. I'll cause you to walk in my word. I'll cause you to walk in obedience to the word of God. All right. That, we seem to have agreement on that point. Let's add this part to it. If then we are filled with the Holy Spirit, we're supposed to represent God in eternal life. Therefore, you should be a walking representative of another kingdom. We don't need more representatives of this kingdom. And if you were a good representative of this kingdom, you would be sitting there with a, with a shirt on and boxes on it that said, I, you, they. Look, my problem is I drink coffee and I go into Starbucks. And I'm in Starbucks the other day, and I'm looking at this person, and I'll be gracious. I'm not being critical, but I just don't get it. I don't get it. I'm looking at this person who's standing there, and he's got, I think, <laughs> I think it's a he. He's got an apron on, and on it he's got three lines, I, you, and then they. The first two boxes are empty. The, the third one is checked. He's a they. He has long hair, and he has nail polish, and he speaks with a really high girl's voice. The challenge for me is to try to order coffee without looking at him because I don't want to have to try to figure out whether I should say thank you, ma'am, or thank you, sir. If you're a representative of this culture, you're going to dress differently than what you are, you're going to act differently than what you are, right? We're going to wear metal in our body if we're a representative of this kingdom, right? Have any of you been out in the 21st century? It, 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 our, our, I mean, the people who represent our culture, they represent our world, They're, they dress and act and, and conduct themselves very differently than what you do, the way you're looking tonight. But he says that if we have the Holy Spirit, we are to represent God in eternal life. So therefore, our lives should reflect the kingdom that we, we are going to. Amen. Not necessarily the kingdom we're living in, but the kingdom we're going to. Amen. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So let my life match that kingdom. Not this kingdom, but let my life match that. What, what priorities God has there, let them be the priority in my life. The way God thinks, let that be the way I think. I'm not responsible for getting me myself to heaven. God's responsible for that. He took the control of that. But my job is to reflect a little bit of the character of the king of that kingdom because his life is in me and to shed and spread a little bit of, uh, of heaven on this earth. 
Now look, the, the guy was, who was in Starbucks there, I, I, I didn't, I didn't uh, say all of that to say that I would just want to make fun of that person. I, if I could, if I had a chance, I'd like to say, hey, listen, it's okay. It's okay for you to be what God made you to be. If you're, if you're a boy, go ahead and be a boy. Become a man. Be a real man. It's, it's all right. It's all right for you to do that. Yeah, the, the cosmos is telling you you don't know. Imagine telling Telling a boy he's not a boy. Then, then the boy actually wondering whether I am a boy or not. And, and you know, uh, you talk about confusion. You talk about uh, a perversion of God's intent. God wants you to know who you are. God wants you to have your identity clear. God wants you to know that you're sons and daughters of God. God wants you to know that you're only here temporarily. You're on your way to your eternal destination. And I have another body over on the other side. Our identity is not unclear. Our identity should be very clear. But Satan makes identity an issue in our time. So we are, support, we are called to represent God and eternal life in this world. We should conduct ourselves, therefore, like men and women, like the Bible said for us to do, Christian gentlemen, men and women. And I will tell you something, that just because you have the Holy Ghost doesn't mean that life is easy. And everything flows together and everybody's happy with you and pats you on the back doesn't happen at all. Matter of fact, very seldom are times like that. You're misunderstood a lot of times. You're misrepresented a lot of times. The way of a Christian is not always easy. I said this morning that sometimes, you know, we come to church and somebody's sitting in your regular pew and you're like, really? Really? The hardships that I have to go through in this church. Surely there must be another church. <laughs> Let me introduce you to Adoniram Judson, great man of God. Adoniram Judson was considered to be America's first missionary. He's the first missionary to ever leave our shores and to go overseas. He was born in the 1700s, 1777, I believe it was. He was born in Walden, Massachusetts, 1788. It's right here. <laughs> Who knew? Walden, Massachusetts. Adoniram Judson was a very brilliant young man. By the age of 12, he was teaching an adult Sunday school on the book of Revelation because he was so learned in the scripture. He was so excited. He was the son of a minister. He was somebody who was very much on fire and really had an understanding of the Bible. He was considered by his peers and by his teachers a brilliant young man. The problem is that Adoniram Judson, even though he was around... Uh, the, the church in his early days, he became uh, to the point where uh, he thought he was so brilliant, he was actually more brilliant than God. And he thought he was actually smarter than God. And so when he went off to college and he went to New York, he, uh, <clears throat> he was admired by his professors and so forth as being someone who was so brilliant and so smart that he could pick any career that he wanted to. And he became a, a teacher, an educator, a, you know, an intellectual. He, he was very renowned, even at an early age, before he was at age 20. There was a story, though, that when he was in college, he had a roommate who he roomed with in the first couple of years, and his name was Jacob Ames. His roommate was a, a new Christian. And Adoniram Judson had such a, a, a prowess in, in Scripture and such a handle of the Word of God that he began to debate his roommate and eventually talked him out of any belief at all in Christianity. And Jacob Ames forsook the gospel and uh, sided with, with Judson, who was so per persuasive in his way. And Jacob Ames departed from the faith. Years later, Adoniram Judson was uh, still unconverted, and he... Uh, was in college in New York, and he was coming back to Massachusetts. And on his journey on his horse, uh, he became really tired at the end of the day, and he wanted to stop in a wayside inn. And uh, he went to the innkeeper, and he said, I'd like to have a room. And the guy says, I don't have any rooms at all. He said, look, I'm so exhausted. I need to have a room. If you don't mind, let me just take any place at all. He said, I don't have any spots at all. He said, listen, you must have somewhere, a closet or anything. And he said, look, the only room that I have is a room next to a man who's dying. And this man spends his days screaming 
cursing. Uh, he's in, in, in incredible pain. They said the smell that comes from the room is almost unbearable. He's full of infection. He's dying. Nobody knows what to do with him. And the only room I have in the house is one, a bed that's right next to his in the next room. You can have that if you want. Judson said, I'll have it. He took the room. He listened to the man screaming for the first part of the night. And about 3 o'clock in the morning, the screaming ceased. And Judson went off to sleep. The next morning, he went down to the innkeeper and he paid his bill. And on his way out, he said, hey, he said, what happened to that man next door to me? What, uh, did he get better? I heard that he stopped screaming out. And they said, no, he died. Judson said, he said, what was wrong with him? He said, we really don't know what was wrong with him. The doctors couldn't figure it out. We really don't even know who he was, except that he was a graduate of this particular university. And his name apparently was Ames. Jacob Ames. That's what the innkeeper told Edna and Judson. The young boy's name was, was Jacob Ames. That's all we know. We don't, and we know he was from a college somewhere in New York, but we don't know anything about him. And when he said that, Judson just kind of stopped. And he realized that this man now had died without God because of what he had talked him out of. He walked outside the inn, took his horse, and began to go down the street, walking the horse. And in those towns back then, with the cobblestone streets, the horses, you know, they make a clip-clop, clip-clop, clip-clop. Every time the horse made a sound with his hoofs, all Judson heard was hell, judgment, hell, judgment, hell, judgment. He walked outside the limits of the city, knelt down by the side of his horse and surrendered his heart to Christ. He realized he had made a horrible mistake and sent this man to hell probably, and he was the one who had caused it. And he realized, I'm destined for the same thing unless I give my heart to Christ. He was under such heavy conviction that he knelt down and gave his heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. A few short years later, he got on a ship and he went to India. He had such a burden for the people in India. And he went there and uh, <clears throat> he was uh, misunderstood by the Indian government and the authorities. And they didn't want to have anything to do with him. But he attempted, because they didn't have the Bible translated into their language, Judson had learned the language of India, and he was attempting to translate the Bible into their language. The Indian people did not understand that. They threw him in jail and tortured him. And he married a wife who he had brought with him to come to India, and she died because of the horrible diseases that were there in the water, and she died. Judson was in prison until the Indian authorities eventually decided they were going to send him out of the country, and they put him on a ship and sent him over uh, it, in another part of the world, just down the way, and they sent him down to Burma, which is now Myanmar, which you hear in the news. And they sent him to Myanmar, and he lived in Myanmar until he died. He was so lonely, he married another girl, and this girl eventually died. He married a third girl, and this girl finally bore him a child. He had lived in Myanmar 23 years and translated the Bible into... Uh, Bengali for the, for the people of India. He did it when he was in Burma. And uh, he, he lived in a uh, ramshackle kind of a place in Burma all of those years. And he had sickness. And he, had, he was living with his third wife. And she had borne him a child. And when this child was born, him and his wife were both in jail in Burma because the Burmese authorities felt like he was preaching against the state. And so they were taking his wife and they were sending her back to, uh, to America. And the only time he got to touch his child was when he reached out through the bars of the jail and touched his baby, touched his infant. And that was the only time he touched his child and they put her, him on a boat, or sorry, they put her and the baby on a boat and sent him back to America. Judson stayed and he died in the jail. He had a horrible disease and he died in the jail. But he had completed the translation of the Indian uh, of, of the, uh, the, the Bible for the Indian people. When he died, they put him on a ship. Uh, sorry, when, when he was uh, dying, they put him on a ship and they were going to send him back to America and he died on the way. If you go to Walden, Massachusetts today, Malden, I'm sorry, I'm missing my words, Malden, Massachusetts today, there's a plaque there outside of a house and it says, this is the home of Adoniram Judson. 
He was born in August 1788 and died in 1850. And this is on his, uh, this is on his tombstone. Malden was his birthplace. The ocean is his sepulcher. He, was conver he converted the Burmese, and they are his monument, and his record is kept on high. Let me ask you a question. Do you think that Adoniram Judson had the real thing? Do you think Adoniram Judson had the real thing, or was he just in the, in, the, in the faith because it was a popular or an easy thing to be in? I believe Judson had the real thing. I believe Judson had the real goods. I believe he was willing to pay a price for the faith that he had. Now, if you remember this, the quotation that I just gave you here, what Brother Branham said was that we're supposed to represent God at eternal life. That is a life of sacrifice. If you're in this for the easy way, you're in the wrong thing. If you're in this because everybody will love you because you're in it, you're in it for the wrong thing. Adoniram Judson was in it because he had a burden from God to be able to do the mission work that he did and to travel like he did and to spend his life like he did. Let me tell you, that's the Christian life. Everybody's not going to do what Adoniram Judson did, but I will tell you, that is a Christian life. He made the statement, he said, if you succeed without sacrifice, it is because someone else has suffered before you. And if you sacrifice without success, it is because someone will succeed after. He preached in India and never had a convert for seven years. He never had anybody accept Christ for seven years. And he knew what it meant to sacrifice. If you succeed without sacrifice, it is because someone has suffered before you. And if you sacrifice, he said, without success, it is because someone will succeed after. The hardship doesn't matter. It is the vision. It is the desire. It is the burden that a person has. That's what matters. And that's what Judson had. And you know what he did? He represented, he represented Christ on this earth. He represented eternal life on this earth. In our lives, we really don't even know how to pray. We don't really know what to pray for. The Spirit helpeth with our infirmities, for we not, know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit maketh itself intercessions for us with uh, groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit. There's, there's a higher power that lays within us that knows what the will of God is. And that's why he put his spirit within you so that you would be guided by his spirit and not yours. And you would be guided by his spirit and not the spirit of the cosmos. And you would be guided by his spirit and not the spirit of your peers or some educator or somebody else. But the Holy Spirit wanted to be in you to guide you so that you would know what the will of God actually is and then be willing to carry it out. I believe, I believe that the dynamic experiences that we have, you know, meetings and coming to the altar and having experiences with God, I think those are very important. I think those are, those are wonderful experiences that we have. But I believe there's more to the Christian life than just an emotional experience at its beginning. It isn't just one experience with God, it is many. Now let me explain it this way. You remember the story. This is the man who is the maniac of Gadara, Luke chapter 8. And Jesus sails over the, the, the Sea of Galilee. I mean, this is, a pretty, this is a pretty exceptional chapter. When you read the whole chapter, it talks about how Jesus had multiplied the food on, on one side of the, the lake. And then he comes out and the storm comes and Jesus calms the storm and the disciples are looking at, at him and, you know, what manner of man is this? I mean, we thought we'd seen it all. And wow, look at this. Look at, look at what, what Jesus has done now. He speaks in the storms and the winds even obey him. He gets off the boat and he goes up over the hill and this man is there. This man is there with shackles on him and chains that doesn't even hold him. He breaks those chains. He's a wild man. Nobody goes near him. He lives up in the mountains there where the, where the swine are. No villages there, no houses there. This man is what Brother Branham describes as a bad man. And he said he lived in his house. He had a problem with anger. He had a problem with his temper. Brother Branham tells, the, the I, we, I don't have the quotes here, but he talks about this man. And, and as a result, things got worse and worse and worse. And finally, he's out there. Uh, completely out of control. Nobody can contain him. He's out in the wilderness, living in the caves and so forth. And they, 
The disciples are watching Jesus. And he walks up over the hill, not to the town, but he walks up over the hill to where this guy hangs out. And he stands there. And when he stands there, this man sees him from afar off. And they begin to communicate back and forth. Jesus, what hast thou to do with me? And Jesus begins to talk to him and casts out the demon. You remember the story. And he says, he says who are you? And he says, I'm a demon. I'm many. And, and uh, these, these uh, spirits cry out and go into the, uh, the, the hogs that are there. And they run down over the hill and they all run into the water and they perish. And this man, hey, you can imagine the disciples. Nobody fell asleep in that service. Right? They're all, they just, they just saw Jesus calm the water. They saw him multiply the fishes and the loaves. And they're, they're looking and they're thinking, what? I mean, what, what else is there? I mean, why, why, it, it, there seems to be nothing that Jesus can't do. And then they come to this and they see all these swine running down over the hill. And they're all dead in the water there. And this man is standing there. The man that nobody approaches ever. When they that fed them, the swine, saw what was done, they fled. And they went and told it in the city and in the country. And then they went out to see what was done. So all the people come out to see, yeah, really? And so they all run out to come where Jesus is. And they come to Jesus and they found the man out of whom the devils were departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. That's kind of one of those biblical understatements. Is this for real? And they're wanting to... They take out their cell phone and they're wanting to get a picture of this guy so they can show it because the people back home are never going to believe this. And here he is. He's sitting at the feet of Jesus. He's listening to what Jesus has to say. And they also, which saw it, told him by what means he was possessed of the devils, he was healed. The whole multitude comes out. I want to say this to you tonight. We needed to have Jesus do the dramatic work of casting the devil out of this man. Because he didn't have a chance unless Jesus did that. But a true encounter with Jesus Christ will drive you to the feet of Jesus. You're not going to have one without the other. Look. I thank God for the experiences that we have in the meetings and the, you know, the glorious meetings and the after service. I, I, I'd never say a thing against it because I believe it is of God. I believe it's, I believe it's a good thing for someone to have an encounter with God where they, where they have a, a, a time of repentance and pouring their soul out before God, realizing they're lost. But let me tell you, if that's all we have, I'd say this to you, we haven't gone far enough. A real encounter with Jesus will bring you to the feet of Jesus. It'll bring you to a place where you want to now attach yourself to, to this one that can teach me a new way of life, that can restore things, that can bring me back to my right mind, that can set me in a place where now I can, I can live among the community. I, I, can be, I can be myself. I can be real. I can be saved. Tell me, Lord, how to be saved. But you don't have one without the other. That's what I'm saying, is that a new birth, it'll cause something. And that, that something it'll cause you, it'll bring you right to the word. It'll bring you right to the right instruction. There's something in you that is quickened by the word of God that'll bring you to the word of God for the hour, and they'll match together. And there's just some kind of peace about that that you don't get anywhere, anywhere else. If you can have an experience like that with Jesus and then go right back out in the world, then you never really went far enough. A real encounter with God will bring you right to his feet. It'll put you in the right place. People want to know about what the evidence is. I'll tell you what. And, and you see people, they'll, they'll make all kinds of excuses why they don't go to church or why they don't want to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll tell you, they may be good people, but they just haven't gone far enough. And this man, he wants in 38. Now, the man whom the devils were departed, uh, they... He, he, they besought him that he might be with him, but Jesus sent him away. I want to go where he goes. I want to be where he is. Wherever, wherever he's holding a meeting, I want to be there. Wherever he's holding church, I want to be there. Whatever he's saying, I want to be there to make notes. I want to hang around him. I want to be there. He says, no, hey, you stay here and be a witness to your community and your family, and you tell the whole city the things that God has done to you. So now he becomes a witness to the community around him because he has a personal testimony of what God has done. Amen. Christian life is not always an easy life. Christian life is not always a simple life. I will tell you something. There's a lot of people may not understand uh, how you as a Christian, how you think, how, 
how you're, you process things. But I will tell you something that if the Holy Spirit is in you, he'll lead you to the word of the hour. And there's, some, there's a fortitude, there's a strength in you that the world doesn't know anything about. Hey, for a lot of years, the devil has tried to stop the church of the living God. For a lot of years, the church has tried to vanquish the spirit of the living God in the believers uh, of the word for their day. And it has not worked. You know why? Because it's not us, it's Christ in us. And we have, essentially, greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. Don't expect that the Christian life is a life of ease, but expect that Christians are overcomers. Can I tell you about another missionary, if you don't mind, just one more. This is perhaps my favorite is David Livingston, who lived in England in the 1800s, born in 1813 in Scotland, Blantyre, Scotland. When he was nine years old, he memorized the book of Psalms 119. And he just had a passion for the things of God. He learned uh, back in that day when they had the early uh, printed books, he saw pictures of Africa. And he said to himself in his heart, as a young boy, he said, I just see the smoke of a thousand fires burning in the heart of Africa. And it just imprinted itself upon his own heart. And he desired to leave. He made three trips to Africa at that point. And he was... Uh, in his journal, he said, Lord, send me anywhere, but go with me is the only thing that I would ask. Send me anywhere, only go with me. In 1862, Livingston contracted yellow fever, and he required medication in order to live in Africa and have and be sustained during the time that he had yellow fever. He married a woman whose name was Mary Moffat. Mary Moffat became so sick she had to go back to London. He only saw her one time after she got sick. David Livingston walked into a branch in the jungle that was cracked off and it pierced him in his eye. He was blind in one eye. He walked all over the place in Africa and he was, one of his, the ways he made his living was to make maps of a previously unmapped part of the world. He only could do it with one eye. At one point in time, he was going through the thick jungle and a lion fell out of a tree on purpose and clomped onto his shoulder and bit into the tendons in his shoulder, and he couldn't use his left arm for the rest of his life. Livingston was a person who did not give up, and he lived among people who he could not understand for most of his life because they spoke a different language. And he preached the gospel everywhere that he went. Everywhere that he could find an audience, he would preach the gospel in his path across Africa. And finally, because they had not heard from him in England for so many years, they sent Dr. Livingston out to find Stanley, or sorry, to find Livingston. And they said to him, go find Livingston. We don't know where he is. We haven't heard from him. We're afraid he's dead, so go find his whereabouts. Dr. Stanley was a very renowned, well-known atheist. And when he got to Livingston, he said the famous words, Dr. Livingston, I presume. He followed Livingston for a couple of months, and he warned Livingston at the very beginning. He said, I'm an avowed atheist. He said, don't try your religion on me. I have no interest in it. It only took three months until Stanley gave his heart to the Lord and followed Stanley around the rest of Africa. And by the way, when he said to Stanley, I'm warning you, don't try to convert me, he says, by the way, he says, somebody sent me some medicine for you for yellow fever. Livingston had prayed that God would send him the medicine because he had ran out of it while he was in Africa for so long. Nobody knew where he was. And so therefore he had prayed and asked God to send the medicine. He said, Lord, you said that I, could go, I would go anywhere, but you would go with me. And he said, I need to have this medicine in order to live. And Stanley pulls out the medicine and gives it to Dr. Livingston. In his later years, when Livingston was so old and so sick, he would say to his servant, he had a man who followed him everywhere, and his name was Chuma. And he said to Chuma, he said, take me out of my bed, he said, and set me up on my knees so I can pray. And he would spend several hours a day praying by the side of his bed. And there were so many people who were converted in Africa by Livingston over his years that he became renowned over the last, especially the last portion of his life. And when he died, when he died, I thought this was extraordinary. Chuma picked up Livingston and carried him 150 miles through the jungle to the edge of the continent and put him on a boat and sent him back to England where he was buried. Chuma loved him so much and the people loved him so much, but before they put him on the boat, they did a surgery. And they did a surgery where they opened up his chest cavity and took his heart out. 
and they brought his heart back to his village and they buried it under a tree because they said the heart of David Livingston will always be in Africa. And they put him on a boat, they sent him back to England and buried him there. And you can visit his grave back in England. Let me ask you something here tonight. Do you believe that David Livingston had the real thing? David Livingston was not somebody who was deterred because somebody took his pew in the church. He was not deterred because they ran out of uh, pumpkin spice at Starbucks in the day that he visited it. He was not a person who easily was, uh, you know, turned away from the mission that God had given him. Remember now what Brother Branham said, if you have the Holy Ghost, he said, you've got to represent God in eternal life in this world that you're living in. You've been given the Holy Ghost to represent him. You have not been given the Holy Ghost to die again. Jesus already did that. You've not been given the Holy Ghost to try to conquer worlds. Jesus already did that. Let me tell you, you've been given the Holy Ghost to represent another kingdom in this earth and to display Christ through your flesh, through your brokenness, in the good times and in the bad. That's the reason you've been given the Holy Ghost. And I will tell you that within yourself, you cannot do that. You cannot come up with stories like this about your own life. It takes Christ in you, the power that keeps you and the power that holds you. And Livingston said, if you have men who will come only if they know there is a good road, I don't want them. I want men who will come if there is no road at all. Nothing earthly will give up my work in despair. If you have men who will only come if they know there's a good road, I don't want them. I want men who will come if there's no road at all. And nothing earthly will make me give up my work in despair. I'll tell you what, saints of God, I believe he was a real man of God. And I believe he had this. There's only one visible evidence and not one fleshly, but it's all in the supernatural realm, Brother Branham said. It's the hidden force that's in you. It's the hidden force that drives you to the tree of life. It's the hidden force that's in you that drives you to an altar when you need to repent. It's a hidden force within you that'll drive you right to the marriage supper. It's the hidden force that's in you that'll say amen to the word of God even when it takes your hide off. The Holy Ghost is given for you to represent Christ in this world. It's not given to you to make your life easy. So this family, Brother Branham knows, very good family. They come to Brother Branham and uh, they asked him if they were not in his church, but they were friends. As a matter of fact, uh, this couple who came to Brother Branham the wife was actually a former girlfriend of Brother Branham years ago. So he knew this family that we're talking about here in this little illustration. And uh, Brother Branham was approached by this couple at the end of service, and they said, Brother Branham, would you come and pray for our daughter? She's in an insane institution, and she's going to go to uh, the, the, the procedure called a lobotomy after this. And this, this was rather primitive back in that day, but this was one of the things that they thought could heal patients who had mental illness. And so they came and they said to Brother Branham, tomorrow they're going to take her. Would you come and pray for this girl? And uh, <clears throat> Brother Branham goes and he, and, uh, he tells a story. He said, he said, before I got there, he said, this doctor came in, this psychiatrist came in and he sat down next to the girl and he began to talk to her. He said, you mean, you mean young lady, she was about 18 years old, he said, you mean young lady, you've never been kissed by a boy? And she said, no, because they were raised in church. And she said, that one time in all my life. You mean you've never had a little drink and been in a party? And she said, never. And he said to her, girl, you don't know what you're missing. Now, him being a psychiatrist, he swung that girl's mind until now she has become so evil and bad till she don't want to even hear the name of Jesus spoken in her presence. So don't tell me there's not hidden forces. There are forces that are going to try to swing your mind away from the things of God. Now watch what he says. It's because that she turned her thoughts from Christ unto what that psychiatrist was moving her mind. And he said, and that's what we're here for this morning, is to move your mind and your thinking from the things of the world unto the things of God, which are eternal. And that's what the preaching of the gospel is for, is to pervert the thinking to a higher and a better. In other words, to undermine the thinking of the world and to replace it with a higher and a better, a place where Christ is until you become converted and then your mind reaches for those things that are above. You'd never appreciate that unless you have the Holy Spirit in you that is satisfied by the preaching of the gospel. And if you don't have it, there are forces that are out there that will twist your mind to the things that are contrary to the kingdom of God. 
So see then that you walk circumspectly and not as fools, but as wise. Circum is the word for circle in the Latin. Speckly is the word for look. So when you walk, you're supposed to look all around to make sure that you are understanding what the will of the Lord is. If you're walking to a bar, you need to keep looking. <laughs> if you're walking to, a, you know, a, a place of evil, then you need to keep looking here. There's a way that seemeth right unto man. We are good at justifying our actions, but there comes a point in time where we need to make sure that we are following God's will because there's a way that seems right unto a man. We had to be very careful that we follow that right way. Brother Branham said, Jesus knew what the Father's will was and what a blessed privilege it is that we can know the Father's will. Do you believe that we can know the Father's will? I believe you're in the will of God tonight. And if we will seek God, God will make known his will. If we seek God, and you know what that doesn't say? It doesn't say that if we look up on Google, we will find God's will. I, I got news for you. God does not need Google. He doesn't even have Google. He was around before Google. And he doesn't Google. We are a people in our culture who love instant Feedback, instant information. You know, you talk to people about something they don't know, they're immediately, Ch -ch 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 -ch. oh yeah, I know what that's about. And we like that instant kind of an answer. God does not, God does not Google. He doesn't send his will by Google. Neither does he normally write it in the sky. But the way to find out God's will is to seek God and, and God will make known his will. Over time, God will make known his will. But your part is not to figure it out yourself. Your part is to seek him with all your heart and seek him with a thirst that is a real passion of thirst to know what God would have me to do. Do you want me to be a Livingston? Do you want me to be a judge center? Do you want me to be a minister here? Do you want me to be a good student here? Do you want me to marry this girl? Or do you want me to go away to college? What is the will of God? The will of God is not the same for everybody. But I believe the Holy Spirit will drive you into the will of God and drive you closer to God all the time when you're in the will of God. Can somebody say amen? amen. I'd rather know that I was in the will of God if I never spoke to another person than to preach to 10,000 people every night out of the will of God. I'd rather know the will of God. <clears throat> I like the way Towser said it. Outside of the will of God, there's nothing I want, but inside of the will of God, there's nothing I fear. Outside of the will of God, there's nothing I want. Inside the will of God, there's nothing I fear. The will of God is the thing that abides forever. And so therefore... Let me tell you, it is, it is a critical thing for us to seek the Word of God. Now, let me just, let me just uh, be pointed here just for a few moments here. And these are some other, you can have all of, these, all of these quotes and things after I'm gone. How do we deal, right now it's mine, all right? Let me do it. How do we deal with conflicting issues and how do we reconcile our feelings and thoughts and dreams with the mind of God? And so... Uh, you know, there's, there's things that you may feel to do, but you need to know is that God's will. And, and there are things that we, uh, you know, sometimes you get offered a job, and then all of a sudden there's another job offer, and you wonder which is the right one to do. And you get accepted in a college, and then you get accepted in another college. So which one am I supposed to go to? Because we all come to this place. We all come to this place. All of us know what this means, right? We come to a fork in the road. <laughs> we come to a place where the, the, the answer is not obvious. And so they're, they're really, I mean, one thing is for sure that God is not going to tell me what the will of God is for you. God's going to tell you. He's going to tell you when you seek him, when you ask him, then he'll tell you. He might, he might have me tell you about other people that have done similar things, but that's not you. He, he wants to deal with you. He wants to deal with your heart. And he wants you to deal with it because he doesn't want me to talk you into the will of God because if it doesn't work out right or it becomes not so easy or you poke your eye out with a branch, you're going to go back and say, but Brother Barry, you told me to go to Africa. God wants you to be convinced of the will of God. God wants you to have that burning in your heart and say, I know this is what God wants me to do. And I tell you what, if God wants you to do something, you'll not be turned away at the first sign of hardship or the first sign of difficulty. I believe that a person who has the will of God has it burning within their heart. They'll continue to do it no matter how difficult it gets. So the idea is for us to walk in the light as God is in the light. 
And when you walk in the light, then you have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Do you realize this is a really critical time for you to be and remain under the blood of Jesus Christ because we live in a very dirty world. We live in a very filthy time. And so therefore, it's very important for us to remain in fellowship with God. Because when you do the will of God, let me tell you, this woman did what she did to Jesus and poured the oil all over Jesus' feet. And when Jesus left, he had the oil on him and he had the smell with him. But because she was doing the will of God, as a matter of fact, Jesus said, don't stop her. Don't stop her. Let her continue. To let, her, let her do it. Let her do it. And wherever the gospel is preached, wherever the gospel is preached, this story will be told of this woman. And you know what? She did this not to become some well-known person through the ages. She did it because God had laid it on her heart. Here was one who was, and Brother Manum said she was anointing him for his death, right? He was, she was anointing him for what he was going, going to go through. And she's led strangely by this force that leads her to the feet of Jesus and rubs him with the oil that she has there. And I'll tell you what, even after Jesus left the room and she walks out of the room, she's got the same smell as Jesus does. She's got the same thing over her that he does because she did the will of God. And that's the way that God wants you to react as well. We're going to do it because it's the will of God. But there's something that spills over onto the believer. We don't do it for reward. We don't do it for renown. We don't do it for gain. But I'll tell you what, what she put on Jesus was all over her as well. You're at your best when you obey God. You're at your best when you live for God. When God says something, and you're at your best. You give me the thumbs up. That means lunch is ready out in the fellowship hall. I have no idea when we started. Full obedience to the will of God entitles you to the token. Now, I remember now, the token is a real thing, right? What Rahab had was a real thing. When they put the blood on the doorpost, they needed to know that was a real thing. I, I, here, let me summarize and say this. I want to have the real thing. I don't want to have... I don't want to have an experience because Brother Mike had a certain kind of experience and now that's what i got to do. And he spoke in tongues and I never spoke in tongues. So Lord, let me speak in tongues because that's what Brother Mike had. And Brother Mike seems like he's really got it. Hey, I want to have, I want to have God deal with me. I mean, we're all made differently, right? I'm not like you. You're not like me. I'm not like Brother Paul and I thank God every day. But I will tell you this. The best thing for you to do is to walk in full obedience to the whole word of God and that will entitle you to the token. You will never walk in obedience to something you don't understand. You ought to pray and ask God to give you the understanding of the Word of God. And if you don't know what you have, you'll never write checks on your account. Full obedience will give you an understanding of the Word of God. And if you don't know what you have, you'll never use it. But an absolute, Brother, Brother Bram says it this way, that's what God wants. It's not a borderline halfway thing, but it's an absolute full surrender an absolute full surrender to the kingdom of God. That's what he's after. So this is where I'm supposed to tell you an inspiring story and wrap it up and have everybody go, whoa, yay, Brother Barry, yeah, great guy. I love this story. Back in the world, end of World War II, the Germans figured out that we were going to win this war by air superiority. They invested heavily in air power, building planes that were fast, that could get in over London, drop bombs, and get out back to safety. It was a big deal for Hitler and his minions to develop air power. Winston Churchill woke up to the fact that if we're going to counter these guys and we're going to win the strike back, we also have to have air power. They did not have superior air power back in that day. So Winston Churchill invested and told his people, he says, get at it. Get, get it done, boys. We need to have air power. We need to have planes that will zip in over Germany, hit the ammunition factories, hit the manufacturing plants, hit, uh, you know, hit the, the uh, strongholds of the Germans and get back out again. We need to have that. We need to have it fast. So they developed this plane, which is called a Spitfire. This was a British invention. It was a really extraordinary plane. Back in the day when they were test flying the plane, and this is how they do test flying the planes, they build a plane with just bare bones. They don't put anything fancy in it, just the operational gear. 
And if you get into a test flight in a plane, there's usually only one seat, lots of wires, gears, levers, handles, and the pilot will get in there, take it up, bring it down, take it up, bring it down. He wants to see how the plane handles. So on this particular day, there was a pilot who was taking the Spitfire up into the atmosphere, and he flew at a certain height, and he was putting the plane through its maneuvers, and he was zipping around and carrying the bombs on it, and he wanted to know how it handled in rough air, this height, that height, and moving it around. In his flying, he's looking around at the plane because he wants to see how everything reacts. He's got to give a report how this plane's going to react and how it all functions. In his looking around, he looks back and he sees in the back of the plane, it's only a little plane, but in the back of the plane, what does he see but a rat? Yes, I said rat, Brother John. Not that Brother John's a rat. I shouldn't have said that. But he saw a rat. And he looks at the rat, and the rat is doing what rats do, and that is chewing on the tubing. He's got a hydraulic cable in his mouth, and he's just sitting there going, chewing on the hydraulic cable. The hydraulic cable controlled the, uh, the back sway of the plane. I forget what it's called, but it controlled the, the, that's the, the, the hydraulic fluid. What? The rudder. He, and so he, could not, he would not be able to go left or right. And so he realized that if this rat breaks through and the hydraulic fluid leaks out, he's in real trouble. There's only one man in the plane, so he can't get out of the seat and go back and boom, kick the rat. He can't do that because he's only one man, and he's sitting in the, in the, in the seat there, and he's looking at that rat chewing on the tube, and he's got he's to make a decision really fast. He doesn't have anyone to consult. He doesn't have anyone to help him. He's looking back at the rat, and he, and he sees this thing. He's got he's to act right now. You know what he does? He takes the plane, and he does straight up. He points that plane straight up. He reaches over, takes his oxygen mask and puts it on, and he goes straight up and to a height that that plane is dangerously in a position, but he's going straight up until he levels out, and the oxygen in that part of the atmosphere is very thin, and he looks back and he sees the rat go, boom, fall over. The rat couldn't handle that height without oxygen. He could because he had his oxygen mask. And he went higher. Let me leave you with this thought and say this. That when the enemy, when the rat in your life is chewing on your cable, don't go lower. Go higher. Go higher with God. The Holy Spirit will lead you higher. Go higher with God. When you get in trouble, go high. When you get into it, you got a problem you can't figure out. When you got a problem you're locked in your seat and you can't do anything about, go high. Don't go low. Go high. And you go high and you watch what God will do. Once that rat keeled over dead, he could come back down onto the ground again. The best thing you can do in life, the best way you can handle the problems that you'll face in life, and we all face them, is not come down and try to reason with this rat and not try to come down and talk him out of it, not try to come down and sort it out or hope you make it. That's not what God wants you to do. I believe, I believe the, 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 the invisible force, the hidden force that lays within us is always going to drive us higher to go to God and say, Lord, help me here. I'm coming to you. I'm coming to you. I'm coming closer to you. And that's what God wants you to do. Let's stand to our feet. The hidden force in you will drive you to the feet of Jesus. It'll drive you to a higher place. It will not drive you to a lower place. Amen. And that's what the Holy Spirit wants to do. If we could have our musicians, come on, slip up here. The Holy Spirit will drive you. It'll remind you that there's sometimes the only thing you can do is be, be closer to him. You may think you've messed up. May, you may think, well, this, this rat has really destroyed things in my life. Let me tell you something. Uh, the Holy Spirit will, will, will just continually move you to a place that's closer to him. In these last days that we live in, with all kinds of rats in our world, you be prepared for the Holy Spirit to lift you higher. That's what services should be like. That's what special meetings should be like. It should be helping you to go a little bit higher. Hey, none of us are without rats in our life. None of us are without problems in our life and, and, and things that, if they could, they would bring you down. If they could, they would crash you on the ground and you'd have no hope, you'd have no recourse. But I will tell you something, the Holy Spirit never leaves you and he wants to bring you higher all the time. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, 
We think about men like Judson, men like Livingston, who had a vision. They had a passion for the things of God. I pray, dear God, that you tonight would just instill and inspire every one of us who have sat at the feet of Jesus for many years, that, Lord, you would inspire us to go higher with you every day, every day that we live, Lord, every experience we have, may it draw us closer to you. We want to be found in the center of your will. We want to be overcomers in our time. But, Lord, all of us, all of us need that hidden force to work, to work strong, to work loud, to work truly in our lives. We want every one of us, Lord, I think every one of us here tonight would say we want to have the real thing. We don't want to have a fake thing. We don't want to have a message thing. We don't want to have a look-alike thing. We want to have the real thing. And there's nothing, nothing that can replace the real thing except the real thing. So, Lord, give us, I pray, the real thing in our hearts. May, Lord... May nobody leave here until they are convinced they have the real thing. May they, be, may they have that assurance. May they have that confidence. Someone like, someone like Judson Lord who would have such tragedy in his life and such torture and sickness and all the other things that he had in his life. But he pursued the calling, the vision that he had that you gave him. Give us that kind of desire. Give us, Lord, as, as ministers, that kind of a desire to, to present the gospel in such a way that people would be drawn to it. That, Lord, the people who receive it, they might go out and represent the kingdom of God in this world. Lord, this world needs representatives from another kingdom. They need a representation, Lord, from a pure kingdom, a holy kingdom, a righteous kingdom. This world needs that kind of a witness. We don't need more confusion. We don't need more religion. Lord, we need truth and righteousness. We need to let the world know that the Holy Spirit can still convict a sinner's heart and turn them around, make drug addicts into believers, and make immoral people into pure saints of God that lift their hands without wrath and doubting and worship the true and living God. I believe the Holy Spirit can still transform young men that have perverted ideals and they can sit at the feet of Jesus, become real men of God that will carry the gospel in their community and in the foreign lands. This never was meant for one or two people. This was never meant just for Brother Branham. Well, Lord, this was meant for those that received the infilling of the Holy Spirit the same Holy Spirit that fell on the day of Pentecost. Lord, this was meant for all of us. All of us have a purpose and a function within the body of Christ. Bless these young people that are here, Lord, that have come aside tonight, and I pray that you would inspire them to go higher. I pray that you would inspire them to reach out to you, Lord, not reach down to the world to see what they can get, but to reach up to you, Lord, that they might be stronger. Give to us the real thing, Lord, I pray. Nothing less but the real thing. That's what we desire. Anchor it firmly, Lord, in our hearts. And we'll give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. Nothing like the real thing. Because you will go through lots of opposition. You'll go through lots of things. You'll have lots of wrath. I'll tell you what, the real thing is, what are you playing?